The Poison Manuscript by Thibaut Bashar. Read by Juanita Grande. Copyright 2020 Thibaut Bashar. All rights reserved. Martha Daniels. Martha circled in red ink, Nepal, a ghost haunted these stunning mountains, where even the shadow of death seemed insignificant. With fear gripping his heart, Jack stepped out onto Suspension Bridge. She set the felt tip pen down on the notebook and turned to the next page of the manuscript open in front of her, on the lookout for additional information that could improve the story's quality, increase its potential. The writing style appealed to her, and Nepal conjured up a wild, mysterious, remote region, a good setting. In the downtown Los Angeles library's reading room, dozens of other loners were hunched over their books, studying and taking notes. Having them around her was comforting. Not again, she thought. Another spelling mistake. She grabbed her pen and corrected it. The feeling was one of being elsewhere, as though she were a stranger to this text, a stranger to herself. She was there and yet she wasn't. She tried to resume reading about the mysteries of the Nepalese mountains, but she couldn't do it. Jack, the ghost, and the Himalayas simply failed to arouse any genuine interest in her. She wasn't making progress, yet she knew she needed to reread the story to the end, and that working away from the apartment would help her avoid slipping into despair. Staying at home was not a good idea. She flipped off-handedly through the thick stack of bound pages. Maybe there was a plot in there after all. She had completed a tremendous amount of work on searching for the lost ark. For over six months, the characters and their story had monopolized her every thought. The outside world seemed just a pale reflection of her reality, an illusion. Searching for the lost ark had become her real life, a mental dimension in which she could give free rein to the power of her imagination, a refuge where nothing was impossible. Nothing else mattered anymore. But now the story was finished, the magic had vanished, and she was anxious, even a little lonely. The story had been like a drug a hard drug that liberated potential endorphins and kept her in an almost permanent state of ecstasy, far from any sort of distress. Her eyes gloomily swept the room, then she thought back to her manuscript. No, she refused to be intimidated by that evil voice inside of her. It was going to happen this time. In the countless hours spent in front of her computer, she had made her characters come alive. She had structured the scenes as though she were personally there and hadn't made the mistake of being superficial. She had to do an enormous amount of research, but it hadn't bothered her. Writing about an adventurer seeking a lost treasure had always been a dream of hers. She accompanied Jack, her main character, for more than 800 pages, creating a believable logic for his actions and a breathtaking backdrop. Deep down, she knew she had never written anything this persuasive. It was just a story, but a real story, one you remember, and that was what mattered. Now, she really needed to focus on the next step, capturing the interest of a decent publisher. She was feeling tired and a bit depressed when she exited the library. With a heavy step, she walked toward her car, parked not too far away, in the shade, on the third level of an austere-looking public parking structure. She was about to open the car door when something familiar caught her eye. A person, a face she recognized in profile, walking briskly between the rows of parked cars. Familiar features that suddenly re-emerged from out of the past. Martha held her breath. Then she remembered the woman's name, Shelley Stewart. She tossed her things onto the passenger seat and nearly slunk off without a trace. But then she thought, Shelley, whatever happened to Shelley? Twelve-year-old memories flashed in her mind like the trailer of a film from another time. In the company of friends, going out, at parties and crowded bars, dreaming of their future. They had been friends, though not close ones and then one day they lost touch with one another. Now more than ten years had gone by, and whatever happened to Shelley Stewart? Didn't she study international law? Shelley's hair was a pretty brown and longer than Martha remembered, her face plumper. But then, she thought, I've changed too. Both women were wearing cotton jumpsuits, pastel blue in Shelley's case, black for Martha. Martha's shoes were black and worn, Shelley's beige and new. Since Martha had started living alone, she found it difficult just going up to people. She always thought she was disturbing them. But this case was obviously different, since Shelley knew her. Martha got up on her tiptoes and waved in her directions. Wary at first, the other woman sped up. Then Martha yelled, Shelley? She stopped, turning her head cautiously. How old was she? Thirty? Like Martha? Something like that, though she looked younger. She immediately recognized Martha, of course. Blonde, tall, thirty-ish face as pretty as her slender figure in her casual apparel. Shelley's face and eyes lit up, and she smiled suddenly, 
feeling slightly ridiculous at the fear she had felt due to being alone and defenseless in the parking structure. Martha, God, it's been forever. What are you doing here? I just left the library. I'm working on a manuscript, her tone slightly blasé. A manuscript? Does that mean you're a novelist? Shelley ventured. Not exactly. I was an English teacher, but I finally quit teaching to devote myself exclusively to writing. Is that right? That's a funny coincidence. How so? Shelley opened her handbag, took out a little white plastic ID badge, and showed it to Martha. I just so happened to be temping at Sutton and Black Publishing, she said with an air of satisfaction. Martha couldn't believe it. She leaned in and gazed with a strange fascination at Shelley's photo beside the company name. That's crazy. Yeah. Are you free right now? Absolutely, said Shelley. Let's grab something to drink. The modern look so typical of Starbucks was comfortable and welcoming the embodiment of Trendy, a well-lit, loft-style space with regionally inspired furnishings and fabrics created a place of contemporary calm, removed from the tumult of the harried world outside. By the 20 or so people inside at 4 p.m. on a Thursday were many tourists speaking languages other than English. Martha ordered a peach lemon iced tea, Shelley a mug of tea with milk. Martha sat her glass down. God, it's been a long time. Ten years at least. I think he just graduated. Martha nodded. That's right. Yes, I remember now. You were leaving California to move in with your dad in New York. I see you've still got a great memory. Martha gave a muffled laugh. <laughs> Shelley continued. Thanks to the money he gave me, I was able to pursue my law studies. But unlike you, I didn't make it. Even if my dad never showed it, I think he was deeply disappointed. I did a bunch of odd jobs, mainly in legal studios. I probably could have found a stable employment at a good company, but life in New York exhausted me, and I missed the West Coast. A year later, I finally came back. They both took a sip of tea, and Martha asked, Are you married? When she saw Shelley tense up, however, she realized her question might have been inconsiderate, if not downright stupid. Sorry, I was insensitive to... Shelley managed a shy smile. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry about it. You mean, did I find the man of my dreams? Martha was no longer accustomed to dealing with reality, much less the actual problems of other human beings. She was embarrassed and already regretted having suggested this reunion. She was also mad at herself for asking a question like that without first examining Shelley's hands, hands with fingers that were bare, ringless, devoid of any adornment. It's just that I seem to remember back in the day you often talked about how one day you were going to marry a rich man. You're right, Shelley replied. Then all of a sudden she burst out laughing, as though evoking this memory had lifted a huge weight off her shoulders. Unbelievable. You still know me after so long. I'm going to tell you, it's the first time I've felt like I can confide in someone. Martha's feeling of regret intensified, yet she softened her voice and said, You can tell me anything, Shelley. I thought I'd found the love of my life. Gary Pickman seduced me from the very first time we met. The company I was working for at the time was hosting a gala evening to support cancer research, and Gary was one of the most important guests, the ones who give their money generously, though I know now that this generosity was nothing but an illusion. I don't follow. For each donation he made, he pocketed twice as much, the art of giving and receiving, as he explained to me. Gary was a Wall Street trader, and I confess that what he did with his money didn't interest me at the time. I loved him, you understand. Martha nodded. Shelley went on. I was madly in love with him. The aura he gave off and the life of luxury he offered me, nothing else mattered. The Plaza Hotel had become my kingdom, our kingdom. I had never imagined experiencing such bliss. Then one day, my entire universe came crashing down. I had finished work early and gone to do a little shopping at Rockefeller Center when I surprised him arm in arm with another woman. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Martha. What did you do? I wanted to be absolutely sure, beyond a doubt, that he was cheating on me with this woman. That caramel-skinned beauty he had his arm around wasn't just an acquaintance. So I followed them from a discreet distance. After only a few steps, right in the middle of a crowd, they stopped, and I saw them kiss, sensuously kiss. How awful, said Martha. I should have left, but what I was seeing hurt too much. I couldn't resist. I screamed out his name, raced over, and slapped him square in the face. At first he was stunned, but then he broke into a smile. It was then I realized that I'd been in love with a bastard of the worst kind. I turned around and left, far, very far away from him. Now I see what brought you back to California. But I have to say I'm not surprised. 
Lots of men are like that. They're erratic. Most of them are genuine hypocrites. I've yet to find my prince charming either. Martha failed to mention that she had had an affair with a married man, a father of two young children, for several years. Martha had done all she could to get him to divorce, but infuriated by her behavior, he ended up breaking things off with her for good. She thought theirs was the perfect romance. He was a plastic surgeon and made a great living, so much so that he bought her a nice apartment on Wilshire Boulevard, in her name no less. In retrospect, however, she realized that it was above all for him and that he had made this purchase as a pied-à-terre, a cozy love nest where his mistress could patiently await him. She had let herself enjoy the comforts of this new life of ease, even quit teaching in the hope that he would end his marriage and wed her instead. She turned into a kept woman and passed the time attempting to become a successful novelist, but in vain. Yet since he left her, Martha had filled his absence by working feverishly on her new novel, as though this painful breakup, this emotional shock, had been what she needed to write. Unlike Shelley, however, Martha would never reveal the love she had felt for this man. She knew she'd seem like a homewrecker, so she decided to be vague on the topic. You don't have anyone in your life? said Shelley, stunned. No, not at the moment. It seems neither one of us have been very lucky in this domain, Martha replied, and the anger she had felt back then made its way even now into her voice and cheeks, which turned red. Solitude is good for me. Doesn't it affect you? How do you mean? Being so beautiful, and yet not taking better advantage of life's opportunities. Of course it does. But next time I'd like to be the one in control. So would I, Martha. So would I. Martha decided to change the subject. Tell me about your job at Sutton and Black. It's my third short-term contract with them. I'm replacing a pregnant woman as a manuscript reader. At least it'll keep you afloat for a while. Martha suggested teasingly. I guess so. They slowly sipped their tea and Martha saw the unhappiness in Shelley's face. She doesn't want to spend her life reading manuscripts even for a prestigious publisher like Sutton and Black, thought Martha. Poor thing. She wants to be swept off her feet. She was in seventh heaven in New York and this creep left her completely devastated. What a pathetic joke running into her right now. When I, too, am a mere shadow of my former self bordering on penniless, a novelist without a future. Uh, then something clicked into place. She began to think, thinking the way she had when she'd been writing in her apartment, like she was busy doing an hour earlier in the library, immersed in the plot of her story. For each of her novels, there had been this click, this idea she had found irresistibly appealing, and that had led her to love writing. She had written three novels that all the big publishers had unfortunately passed on, forcing her to take the self-publishing route to see her work in print. The results, in other words, had so far been quite underwhelming. What she lacked was recognition. Since her breakup, writing had become the engine of her life. She hadn't felt this desire to create for a long time, and here and now she knew this last click heralded the beginning of a new story. But this one would be different. She wouldn't write it back to her apartment, or anywhere else. No. This time there would be no book. She would be the protagonist in her own story, a new experience for a new life. Shelley was staring at her, curious. Martha, what is it? I think I've found the answer to our problem, Shelley. It can work. We can do it. What are you talking about? Money. What do you mean? We've both reached the same point in our lives, Shelley. You've lost your pretty illusions. I've lost mine. I'm past the point of no return, and soon I'll be scraping the bottom of the barrel. Recently, I've gone through almost all the money I'd set aside. You must have some savings. You'd think so? So did I. But then I crossed paths with an extremely self-centered man, and now I've been living alone for over six months, unemployed, working on my novel. Now, all of a sudden, I figured it out. I know how to get out of this situation. And you, Shelley, you're going to get out of it, too. Shelley let out a joyless laugh, then her face turned serious. What do you have in mind? You work for a publisher. But that's not getting you anywhere, Martha reminded her. I have a book, but no publisher. Have you written any other books? Don't worry. They were all self-published on Amazon under the pseudonym of Julia Wolfe. Julia Wolfe? Sorry, never heard of her. And to think that things were going pretty well initially, my first book, Guilty by Necessity, was the one that sold best. I earned $20,000 in less than two months. It was encouraging. I was confident. But the wind in my sails soon died down, and I tumbled into the very bottom of the list of unknown authors. It's all because of their fucking algorithm. I mean, this thing is like a dinosaur of the T-Rex variety, constantly demanding something new, fresh flesh. 
And if you aren't referenced among the top sellers, you're no longer one of those choice morsels. It sees you as rotten meat and takes no more interest in you. Not until the next book, at least. Shelley smiled faintly. What's your manuscript about? It's the story of an archaeology student, said Martha, who finds an untitled book on a heap of volumes that have been dumped in a dank New York alley. Reading the book leaves him in an extremely agitated state because the text it contains is so unsettling, so intriguing, that it may be something more than some unknown writer's attempt at good fiction. What does he decide to do? Go to the ends of the earth if necessary, to penetrate the book's mysteries and put an end to the doubts this text has aroused in him. Shelley shook her head. Is it a series? It could be. There's lots of other stuff, too, about the Ark of the Covenant, Nepal, the secrets of antiquity. I'd explain the whole plot to you, but then you'd know far too much. Shelley burst out laughing. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Martha smiled. Shelley liked the story. I hate to inflict the last six months of my life on you, Shelley, but you have to read it. Who's read it so far? No one, Martha said. See what I mean? It can work. Where is it? Martha's eyes sparkled. Shelley had taken the bait. In my car. Give it to me, said Shelley. I'll let you know my thoughts. If it's what I think, I'll rework it a bit to bring it in line with our editorial strategies, then propose it as though this book, your book, were worth its weight in gold. Martha, if I manage to convince them, the advance alone for this type of book is $2.3 million. Martha looked stunned, but she nodded and said, that doesn't surprise me. Martha realized that the stakes had just changed. Now she held all the cards. It remained to be seen, though, she thought, whether or not she was up to the challenge. Shelley looked at her watch. I need to go. Let's walk to your car. You're right, said Martha. The sooner the better. They got up, cleared the table, and strode toward the parking structure. As they walked, Martha said, That makes $1.15 million each. More than 20 years of salary. I'll split everything with you. The royalties on the book sales, the movie and merchandising rights. As for taxes and all that, we'll have a CPA finalize all the details. Martha, this is crazy. Hardly, Shelley. What does your editor care whether this is my manuscript or one of those you receive every day as a first reader? What matters is grabbing their attention. Anyway, you have everything to gain. Don't forget that it's just a temporary job. When the woman you're replacing comes back, your publisher won't hesitate to let you go. No matter how diligent you are, between her and you, they'll choose her. This woman has a full-time job. She'll get her spot back, just like before, and you will once again be out of work. Shelley furrowed her brow and tried to find some objections. Yes, but if someone finds out... They reached the car. Martha opened the door, relieved to see her bag on the passenger seat where she had left it. There won't be anything to find out, said Martha, taking out the manuscript, because once you finish tinkering with it, you'll give me a call and we'll meet back here so you can give it back to me. They exchanged numbers. I understand, said Shelley. Then I imagine you're going to retype it on your computer to create a digital record of it before sending it to me by mail, correct? Exactly. I'll mail it directly to your publishing company, like any old anonymous writer trying her luck. Here it is. Now it's up to you. Shelley felt the weight of it. This is quite the tome. Martha agreed. I know, and believe me, it's worth a shot. Shelley gave her a sympathetic smile. Don't worry, I'll read it. Shelley Stewart She liked the single life. No one bothered her. No one stuck their nose in her business. And that was certainly a positive. She could have gone back to live with her mother in Pasadena, but it would have been too painful, too constricting. She would have asked too many questions about her father, New York, and especially about Gary Pickman, the only man Shelley had ever loved. Why did he make her suffer so much? She had given herself to him, and the ruthless monster had stabbed her straight through the heart with a white-hot blade. She liked her small furnished apartment where she could cry as much as she wanted, far from prying eyes. But tonight, Shelley didn't want to cry, or even feel sorry for herself imagining all sorts of ridiculous scenarios in which things might have turned out differently with Gary, like in the manuscripts she received at the office. Shelley needed to reflect on her day. She needed to get things clear in her own mind. She wasn't accustomed to propositions like the one Martha Daniels had made her. Vague memories of Martha from the time they'd been friends with the same people materialized in her mind. She couldn't even remember whether she'd liked Martha all that much before. But what Shelley certainly did remember about Martha Daniels was that she was always the leader, someone who wanted to be in charge of the rules of the game. 
Clearly nothing had changed. No sooner had Martha appeared than it seemed as though she possessed the access code to Shelley's brain, a direct path to her most intimate secrets. Shelley felt like a fool. She felt guilty for telling her everything, even the most intimate details. Martha was to all intents and purposes a stranger, yet she now knew more about her than her own mother. As she crossed through the apartment in the direction of the kitchen, Shelley hoped there was some juice left in the fridge. A nice cold glass of juice would disperse the confusion in her head and help her see things clearly. She murmured, Martha snaps her fingers and I'm at her beck and call. Only she would get this sort of idea. Who do you turn to when you're a struggling unknown novelist? Why, naturally, your dear devoted Shelley. A half-empty juice bottle sat on the refrigerator's lower shelf. She thought about drinking directly from the bottle, then opted to take a glass. Just because she lived alone didn't mean that suddenly anything goes, especially when it came to good manners. She sat at the table drinking, taking care to savor each swallow. Then she made herself a chicken sandwich with a few lettuce leaves, chopped tomato, and two slices of cucumber, telling herself, Nothing's forcing you to accept her offer. And as she cut the vegetables, she thought back to their conversation that afternoon and had to admit that Chance certainly had been extremely kind to Martha. But had it been Chance after all? In her recollection, she heard Martha speaking with an insinuating, manipulative tone. Shelley was angry at herself for revealing all her tricks for adjusting a story so as to pique her publisher's interest. She had really let herself get carried away. What if the manuscript was pathetic, completely absurd, and poorly written? She thought sourly. Feeling more relaxed now in the calm that pervaded the kitchen, she realized that in the excitement of running into this manipulator, she had made things seem easier than they actually were. The apartment suited her for the time being. The rent was reasonable, and she had no complaints about her neighbors, quite rare for a two-room apartment in the heart of the city. She ate hungrily. Sitting in the kitchen, glass in hand, she looked gloomily around the room. Then she got up, put the glass in the dishwasher, cleaned the crumbs off of the table, and murmured, What makes her think I do what she's asking me? I've never done anything like this. It isn't me. Is it dishonest? Suddenly, the mere mention of the word dishonest made Gary's ghost reappear interrupting into her mind so violently that she was overcome with an anger that made her entire body burn. All these hours of pleasant calm in its presence, with the hope of new nocturnal, as yet undiscovered adventures, got her so agitated that she thought she was going to faint. She turned around, glimpsed the two-thirds empty juice bottle, grabbed it, nearly threw it at the wall, then regained control of herself and put it back in its place in the fridge. She shook her head, walked out of the kitchen and headed for her desk in the bedroom, a congenial space situated at the back of the apartment. She liked how comfortable it was. The Louis XVI medallion armchair restyled in beige fabric, the vintage mango wood desk and its large drawers full of well-organized folders and its small, original lamp. She sat down and at first did nothing, simply gazing at the workstation before her, soaking up the room's atmosphere. Then she unlocked her smartphone, opened the dictaphone application and hit record. Certain events entail terrible implications, such that I began to doubt my own sanity. Maybe I should see a psychiatrist who, after hearing what I have to say, could give me some advice. But what do I have to say? She repeated. That I'm broken inside? That I was foolish enough to believe in a fairy tale romance? That an old acquaintance has come back into my life and I already have the strange feeling she's exercising a harmful influence on me? Shelley hit pause and listened to what she'd said. Her words astonished her. Initially, she was speaking with an innocent, vulnerable voice. But toward the middle of her monologue, there was this slight change, and by the end, her tone was abnormally calm. She saved the recording and glanced at her phone. 8 p.m. She had been home now for two hours, but had lost track of the time. Night had fallen, and she was alone in her apartment. She wasn't expecting anyone. No one was expecting her, and that suited her just fine. At least this had been the case until Martha Daniels' sudden reappearance. In the space of their brief meeting, Shelley had felt increasingly tempted to turn her back on what she'd become, a joyless, lonely woman who lived only for her work, a job which she didn't even like that much. Now for the first time since leaving New York, thanks to or because of Martha, Shelley hummed with the desire to go back to being the woman she once was, loving, happy, and above all, rich. Nevertheless, Shelley recalled something she'd noticed about Martha. It wasn't palpable, and she didn't notice it immediately during their conversation, but she had felt a strange sensation in her presence, a feeling that some might attribute to a sixth sense, others to intuition. It defied logic, but something about Martha had rankled her. Shelley wasn't sure of the exact cause, 
but she had felt a genuine sense of discomfort during their encounter. It wasn't Martha's somber clothes or worn shoes. It had nothing to do with her appearance at all. It was her attitude. Whatever she had been through, whatever trials she had endured during her life, Martha Daniels hadn't lost this troubling, charming beauty that set her above the melee, as though the problems of existence didn't affect her. They affected people like Shelley, who didn't always manage to hide their feelings, who needed to talk about things. In fact, Martha hadn't said word one about her personal life. She skirted the subject, was discreet, vague, almost condescending. But searching her soul, Shelley said to herself that her own jealousy may have been the cause of this unusual reaction that had upset her so deeply. It's probably just my imagination acting up again, she thought. Perplexed, she shook her head, then got up and set the thick manuscript on her chest of drawers. Martha Daniels No distractions worked anymore. Nothing interested her anymore. Martha opened her eyes once again, sleep tirelessly avoiding her. She turned over and curled up, trying to escape the thoughts that assailed her beneath the shelter of the sheets. Then she turned on her bedside lamp. The alarm clock read two o'clock in the morning. Randolph Perkins wasn't there any longer. Randy wasn't by her side to comfort her, support her, protect her from her fears. He would lie to his wife and children, claiming that he was going away for a few days to lecture up in Northern California about advances in plastic surgery or anything else to justify the lovely romantic escapes with his mistress, Martha Daniels, the only woman who turned him on, as he put it so well. Then he would join her for nights of drunken pleasure. But that was all in the past now. She missed Randy's warm, loving body terribly tonight. He was out of her life for good this time. Had she pushed him away? But what was the point of feeling bad, thought Martha. If I never would have accepted living in another woman's shadow, then there was all the rest. She couldn't deny it. Her love for Randy had never been anything more to her than a good time, an amusement, an accessory. But what made her truly furious was that she would never be able to take advantage of the Perkins family wealth. Tonight, she had a new worry as well, a worry that screamed in her brain and gave her insomnia. How idiotic she had been to make that proposal to Shelley Stewart. She was annoyed with herself for unveiling her writing plans and her ambition to become a successful novelist. Why had she given Shelley the fruit of her incalculable effort, perhaps the greatest work of her entire life? Why had she acted so familiarly to a woman she barely knew, and about whose life she knew next to nothing? This near stranger might have nothing but bad intentions toward her. She might use the main idea of the story, Martha's own ideas, to help some famous author short on an inspiration publish a novel as though it were their own original work. At the publishing house, Shelley might consult the list of those who'd enjoyed fleeting glory and make one of them an offer, saying she'd found the means of getting their career back on track. They might decide to take her up on it. There would be a contract, written in the author's own hand, which, among other things, would stipulate the cession of part of their rights to Shelley Stewart. For Christ's sake! Martha had acted rashly, hadn't considered these contingencies. It was like she'd been forced, forced by Shelley. Wasn't it Shelley who'd suggested the whole plan in the first place? Was she just playing a part? The tearful woman? The vulnerable creature who easily gains people's trust? Shelley in the role of fragile woman, above suspicion. Yet she had been the one who said, Give it to me, give it to me, referring to the manuscript. None of it made any sense. If Shelley dared go back on their agreement... Martha would make her pay dearly for it. Even if the manuscript wasn't protected, Martha could always prove that she was the real author. It would take time, but eventually, she would win the case and those who had decided to publish her manuscript without her permission would be sued for plagiary and have to pay her a lot of money. The situation was upsetting, forcing her to imagine increasingly far-fetched scenarios about Shelley Stewart instead of focusing on Martha Daniels, the very famous and wealthy novelist she envisioned becoming. Sitting there writing all alone for such a long time hadn't been good for her. She went outside to get a breath of fresh air, barefoot, in a simple ivory-white silk pajama. The sensation of being up so high, close to the void, made her uncomfortable. She stood silently, motionless, her forehead furrowed, before the illuminated city in the calm night. She wasn't suicidal, but like every time she came out there, she sensed the attraction. Tonight, however... It wasn't the coolness of the air or the breeze flowing from the north that sent a chill down her spine. It was the several dozen meters separating her from the sidewalk. Suddenly she was afraid of herself out there on the balcony, a place she usually loved. She gently let go of the railing, then went back inside. 
What can she do with my manuscript? How much could she make from it when it was all said and done? Certainly not much, Martha thought. I need to take every precaution to stop these thoughts from getting the better of me. First of all, stop accusing this woman of wanting to harm me. You don't judge a person based on mere suppositions, Martha told herself. Then arm myself with patience and prudently wait for her call as we agreed. Trying her luck with other publishing houses, taking the usual route, following the rules, was not the solution. After enduring so many refusals of her other eventually self-published manuscripts, she knew that was not the road. It was too limiting, took too long, and was far too unreliable. Something different was required. She needed someone in-house, someone who knew the ins and outs of the profession, who was capable of influencing a publisher to bet on her manuscript. The fortuitous encounter with Shelley couldn't have been just a lucky coincidence, she thought. These final thoughts finally allowed Martha to relax. She succumbed to exhaustion and fell asleep, not in her bed, but on the living room couch. In her hands was a small notepad, open to a page with Shelley Stewart's phone number written in black ink. Shelley Stewart Late Friday afternoon, Shelley Stewart left the office and went to do some last-minute shopping for the weekend. When she got to her apartment, she felt less tired than usual. She hadn't worked on Thursday because the office was closed for construction. The very day I met Martha Daniels, she thought. How mysterious life is. That night, she began reading the manuscript, searching for the lost ark. The first looked up left her in a state of shock for several moments. It didn't last long, but she thought it might have been an optical illusion. The alarm clock showed two o'clock in the morning. She looked at her watch, same time. Shelley had been reading and taking notes for almost six straight hours. There was no doubt about it. So far, the novel was very good. It was no amateur job, as she had initially feared. Shelley slipped a bookmark between the pages and closed the manuscript. The reading had exhausted her, and the following morning she slept in far later than usual, leaping out of bed and putting her slippers on when she finally got a look at the time. Shelley spent the whole weekend reading, plus Monday at the office. No one suspected anything because, after all, reading was what they paid her for. Shelley worked on searching for the lost ark for two and a half weeks. She corrected the mistakes in spelling, grammar, tense, punctuation, typing, and syntax. Structurally, it was quite good, though she did identify a sequencing issue that could have made it even more captivating. She slightly modified the book's tone and its narrative hook, increasing the suspense so it could become a genuine bestseller. By carefully analyzing the story and psychology of certain characters, she figured out how to reinforce their thinking through more effective word choice. The book needed to start with a bang. She switched some things around, turning Chapter 8 where a panic-stricken man jumps from the 44th floor of a downtown New York skyscraper after shooting out the glass window separating him from the void into Chapter 1. Shelley was familiar with readers' needs, and this sensational opening would grab the audience from the very first page. In addition, this order lent itself perfectly the novel's adaptation to the big screen. In this field, staying one step ahead was the recipe for success, and working for a publishing heavyweight like Sutton and Black, Shelley was well aware of it. When the following weekend rolled around, she called her mother, Jennifer Davis, to ask if she could use the latter's yacht, which was docked in Marina del Rey. Her mother said that it was at her disposal, so Shelley, once again able to take advantage of the boat to read in the port, where she continued working on Martha Daniels' novel. She was relieved that her mother hadn't asked too many personal questions. She still wasn't comfortable enough talking openly about her new life as a single woman in Los Angeles. It needed to remain a secret. After divorcing Shelley's father, Jennifer Davis had a sultry affair with a rich Texan industrialist named Clyde Miller. Their tryst didn't last very long. But while they were together, Clyde bought her this magnificent boat as a token of his love. What a cruel joke. Jennifer often kicked herself for not marrying him before he left her for a much younger woman. At least she would have been rich. Jennifer was currently dating Charles Davis, a newly retired lawyer whom she'd fallen for more out of chagrin than true love. Nevertheless, she had grown quite close to him, managing to fill some of the great emptiness left by Clyde Miller's departure. The breakup still made her suffer, and the handsome, filthy rich Clyde still loomed large in her thoughts, even as she now led a life of leisure with Charles in Pasadena. Shelley never told her mother, but she had grown quite attached to Clyde. When she still lived with her father in New York, she had met him several times during holiday visits to her mother. Clyde made her laugh, was charming, and knew how to ease the tension between her and her mother. 
It was during these brief periods of respite that Clyde Miller introduced her to the pleasures of sailing. He taught her everything. Thanks to him, Shelley had earned her offshore sailing license and could now pilot her mother's yacht. Jennifer had often thought of sailing it. The proceeds from the sale would have earned her a nice sum of money indeed. But like her daughter, she was quite attached to it. Certainly not for the power of its engine, or because she was a sailing aficionado. She didn't have a permit and had no interest in getting one. For her, it was a matter of nostalgia. The yacht reminded her of a carefree time when she had been happy, when she and her daughter had shared brief moments of indescribable joy, the mere memory of which sometimes brought tears to her eyes. But that was in the past now. Clyde had broken things off with her, and she would never forgive him for it. For the moment, things weren't going too badly, even if she suspected that her daughter Shelley had suffered a similar reversal of fortune with this Gary Pickman in New York. Cruel destiny seemed determined to inflict on her daughter the same romantic disasters that had befallen her. The boat offered an excellent level of comfort, both inside and out, with elegant built-in furnishings, a lounge, a mahogany desk, a beautifully designed bathroom, and a king-sized bed. Since moving to Los Angeles, Shelley hadn't used the boat much, but this month she was spending an increasing amount of time on board. The yacht was comfortable for a night or two, at which point she would return to her apartment because she started to miss the place that was truly her own. Shelley had done all that she could for the manuscript. She proceeded with a final revision and completed the rewriting. It was a very good novel, but Shelley had improved it in spectacular fashion, putting every ounce of energy into it. It was magnificent, unmatched in its potency, and was like nothing she had ever read. She was amazed, proud, and astounded at her own talent. It was time to call Martha and set a meeting to give the manuscript back. Martha Daniels Martha wrote, From the darkest depths of Tibet, a Chinese monk sent a letter to me. Inside was a crumpled scrap of paper bearing a single sentence, written by a nervous hand, unsigned and undated. She tried to dive back into the story whose first volume, Searching for the Lost Ark, had inspired her so much, but it was excruciatingly hard for her to concentrate. She had to sit there for an hour or two in front of her computer, but like every other time she'd tried for nearly three weeks, she couldn't stem the tide of parasitic thoughts flooding ceaselessly into her brain. Why don't you call me? Did you read my manuscript? Did you like it enough to go forward with the plan? And if so, do you think it'll work? She stared at her smartphone as though something were inevitably going to happen. The letters on the screen said Tuesday. The numbers just beside read 10 o'clock in the morning. Had it really almost been three weeks? She picked up the phone and was tempted to call Shelley for an update, but once she refrained and put it back down, right in front of her, within easy reach, an invisible force prevented her from calling, a force that fed on her fears, the fear of being ridiculous, the fear of disturbing an overly scrupulous reader, the fear of having gotten it all wrong and betting on the wrong person, the fear of not being good enough to make their plan a reality, but most of all, the fear of finding out the truth. This waiting was unbearable. Yet she had tried everything to keep her nerves in check. Yoga, swimming, jogging, nothing worked. She was on edge. And the second volume wasn't progressing. Suddenly, her smartphone rang, triggering alarm bells deep inside her. She froze at the sight of Shelley's name on the screen. Then, her curiosity irresistible, she picked up. Hi, Shelley, she exclaimed. Hi, Martha, how are you? From her tone of voice, Shelley was clearly in excellent spirits which in turn soothed much of the tension that had built up in Martha recently. Very well. I take it you've finished reading the manuscript, Martha asked, dreading the answer. Absolutely. To tell you the truth, I devoured it in three days. As though this reply had quickly lifted a huge weight off her shoulders, Martha breathed deeply. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. It really means a lot to me. I do need to tell you something, though, Shelley added, hesitantly. Okay. Martha was suddenly on edge. As I told you I would, I took the liberty of making some changes. Is that right? Some changes? A lot of them? Martha said with surprise, her tone cordial but tinged with mistrust. Don't worry. I'll explain everything. How about meeting at that Starbucks? I'll bring the manuscript. Sounds great, Shelley. Noon came quickly. They arrived at Starbucks almost simultaneously. Shelley made the first move, ordering a vegetable wrap, a cookie, and a piping hot coffee. Martha's order was practically identical, with tea instead of coffee. 
They sat down at the back of the large room in a comfortable, quiet area. Shelley placed a large white envelope on the table. Well, it's all there. I hope you like it. Don't worry. I'll certainly let you know what I think. See, Martha? I told you I would read it. Yes, and you kept your word. Now the question is whether you're still of mind to continue. Absolutely. I've had time to appreciate the value of your manuscript. And now that I've made the necessary adjustments, I'm almost certain that it can work. Martha immediately realized that Shelley hadn't felt the original manuscript was that good at all, and that she'd had to improve it to make it worthy of being published. Improve it, she thought suddenly, crazy with anger. But how much exactly? Did you make a lot of changes? She asked curtly. Shelley sensed the resentment in her tone, and it brought a smile to her face. I admit I spent a lot of time on it. Martha snatched the envelope and began to open it, but Shelley stopped her, blocking her wrist. Don't look at it here. Someone could walk in on us, Shelley whispered. As though caught red-handed, Martha set the envelope down and then delicately pushed it back to its previous resting place. You're right, of course, Martha said, her tone more conciliatory. They ate silently, digesting their meal as well as each other's words. Listen, take all the time you need to read it, said Shelley, pushing the manuscript toward her. Look at what I did, then let me know if you're okay with it. All right, then what? Martha said as she slipped the manuscript into her bag and rose to her feet. Then we make our decision, Shelley said bluntly, sinking her teeth into her wrap. Back at her apartment, Martha got ensconced on the couch and started in on the manuscript. Reading her own book was already quite unnerving, but now that someone else had rewritten it, the experience was downright surreal. It wasn't about determining whether it was better or worse than before. It was the mind-numbing contrast that imbued each and every page. You recognize everything, but it's no longer in the same place, and certain details escape you completely, like you'd passed into another dimension. Destabilizing, disconcerting, and yet fascinating. A world turned upside down, impredictable where your normality no longer exists. Martha experienced the book as though she were reading it through the looking glass. When she finished, her first reaction scared her. Reluctantly, she felt boundless admiration. She got the unsettling sensation that the person to whom she entrusted her raw diamond had cut it with infinite precision, then tirelessly polished it before masterfully transforming it into the most beautiful jewel she'd ever laid eyes on. The thought terrified her. Eventually, she calmed down and stopped asking herself how Shelley had done it. Martha didn't feel the need for an explanation. Shelley had done exactly what was required, namely, placing the eighth chapter at the beginning of the novel and ramping up the intensity of the dialogues. She realized how gratifying this experience was because it meant that she, Martha Daniels, was doing some very good work. If that weren't the case, Shelley would never have read the manuscript all the way through, much less revised it the way she had for you could tell that the true engine behind this extraordinary work of revision wasn't the mere lure of money, even if it certainly played a significant role, or the fact that Shelley was just starting out in publishing. Rather, it was the enthusiasm the manuscript had aroused in her that led to her passionate work in honing the story to perfection. Thanks to Martha, Shelley was able to give expression to a talent she may not even have known she possessed. Martha realized then that they had depended entirely on one another to tease out the full beauty of their work. Martha and Shelley were as one, but this also highlighted another darker, more disquieting aspect of this strange partnership. Without Shelley Stewart, Martha Daniels' novel wouldn't exist. The following week, Martha called her lawyer, Debbie Archer, and they set a meeting that same afternoon. Debbie Archer had handled her legal affairs since the breakup with her ex-lover Randolph Perkins. When Randolph had realized that Martha would stop at nothing to destroy his marriage and take his wife's place, he immediately activated the Perkins clan's horde of lawyers to stop her with charges of stalking and attempted extortion. But Martha wasn't a woman who would let herself be pushed around. Indeed, she had shown herself to be quite far-sighted during her affair with this rich husband and family man. With the money Randolph regularly gave her to keep her entertained and persuade her to wait patiently for his next visit, while he was with his wife and kids, she had secured the services of Debbie Archer, a lawyer whose reputation as a tough customer preceded her. It was she who managed to extinguish the Perkins' blazing anger and prevent Martha from getting her wings burnt. Debbie had recently moved her office to Wilshire Grand Center, which was perfect for Martha, who lived just a little ways down the street. Debbie Archer's smooth, shimmering, jet-black hair contrasted almost shockingly with the whiteness of her impassable face. Her handshake was as unsurprisingly icy. 
She waved Martha to have a seat in a leather armchair, then sat down on the other side of the desk. What can I do for you, Miss Daniels? I need you to draw up a contract for me, said Martha. I need it to be done quickly and remain secret. Debbie looked at her watch with curiosity but not surprise. With Martha Daniels, she'd come to expect the unexpected. I remind you, Miss Daniels, that everything that goes on within these walls is completely confidential. I'm listening. Martha crossed her legs, set her sack in her lap, placed her right palm on the back of her left hand, and took a deep breath. Even if she wasn't entirely conscious of it, the gesture reassured her. But to her lawyer, it betrayed a certain apprehension, which her professional vigilance could not fail to detect. You know, she said, that I've always loved writing, writing novels. My need to write only increased after my breakup with Randolph Perkins. I suddenly had all the time necessary to focus and devote myself to my passion. I know it mustn't have been easy. Randolph was very important to you. But I'm delighted to see that this experience has also been beneficial to you, the lawyer remarked in a neutral tone. Actually, Debbie, it hasn't. Not at all. And this is precisely why I wanted to see you. This time, Debbie was surprised. What do you mean? No one wants to publish my books. But as I sit here talking to you now, I've finally figured out why, thanks to an old acquaintance who recently came back into my life. She's turned out to be an extremely talented collaborator. This woman has managed to identify certain bad habits and flaws in my writing. You know that I was well into my new book. Well, now it's finished. She made it possible. Frankly, this book wouldn't be what it is today without her incredibly thorough revision. Debbie nodded, a bemused look on her face. And you can trust this woman? Absolutely. When did you last see her? Our paths diverged, oh, it must have been about a dozen years ago. Meaning that she's now a total stranger. Were you too close before? Debbie's tone was dubious. Not too close, I have to say. But she was good company, and I consider the priceless help she's given me on the manuscript to be work of the highest level, which might be no surprise at first glance given that she's a manuscript reader at Sutton and Black Publishing. But I'm intimately convinced that when she read my manuscript, she became deeply invested in it. I literally couldn't have dreamt of a better collaborator, hence my decision to partner with her. Debbie leaned forward, placed her forearms on the desk, enlaced her fingers, and stared at Martha, as though she were trying to plumb the depths of her mind. I see. Her answer threw Martha for a moment, making her wonder what she meant by, I see. Was it, I see that you're not telling me the whole truth, or just, I see? This woman helped me create a masterpiece, and if it becomes a bestseller, I want to reward her for that. Have you agreed on the details? said Debbie, picking up a pen lying near a pad of paper. The contract will specify that she is employed as my literary consultant and that her work is confidential, Martha said, pausing to give Debbie time to write. It will not mention her participation in the writing or her revision. It will state that the book must be published under the name Martha Daniels and that if this does not occur, the contract will be null and void and she will not be paid. If it does, how much will she be paid? $1,150,000 upon the advance, then half of all royalties, foreign and film rights, and all the rest. Debbie was incredulous. That's a lot of money. If things work out, she deserves it. It will be my contribution. I certainly owe her that much. Certainly. You would know, Miss Daniels. Is your work protected? Yes. A copy of the new version is currently under a bailiff's supervision. A wise precaution. One never knows. Debbie's pen was poised over her notepad. Title of the book? Given the commercial stakes, the publisher will decide on the title most suitable to attract readers. Ultimately, it's their decision. I understand. And your collaborator's name? Shelley Stewart. Martha watched the lawyer write her partner's name down, then, despite herself, broke into an almost imperceptible smile. And who represents her? No one. This is between me and her. Shelley Stewart. Her work at the office was becoming routine. The manuscripts she received were riddled with all sorts of mistakes and inconsistencies, did not have the least creative genius, and were incapable of truly stirring the reader. Martha was clearly exercising an increasing influence on Shelley's judgment. But she had to keep a clear head. This was no time for people to start questioning her reliability, not when she might need it the most. Her credibility has recently received a big boost when she managed to hook a very big fish in the pile of manuscripts that cluttered her desk. The novel, Gina Warren's The Girl Who Escaped from Heaven, 
was now generating millions of dollars in sales, and it was thanks to Shelley. But she hadn't seen a cent of it. The publishing company gave her temp agency a $600 bonus to be tacked onto her salary. But when her short-term contract came to an end, it would be goodbye, young lady. This was aware of how unacceptable this was, but far more so now that Martha Daniels had reappeared on the scene. Shelley was beginning to lose patience. Two weeks had passed and still no news from Martha. Then one evening, she got a text from her. Send me your email address, please. Shelley texted the information back almost immediately, followed by a smiley. She went online, opened her email, and a message from Martha immediately appeared. It was three copies of a contract between Martha Daniels and Shelley Stewart. The terms were exactly what Martha had proposed during their first change reunion. I see, Shelley told herself enthusiastically, that all my rights are accounted for. I'll get half of all future earnings, including royalties, film, and merchandising rights, and all the rest. My God, Martha, I love you. She was euphoric. Accompanying the contract was another message, a brief note from Martha. Dear Shelley, you need to sign each copy. Keep one for yourself and send the other two back to me. Thanks for your tremendous contribution to this incredible feat of the imagination. I'm sure this collaboration will be very beneficial to both of us. Your friend, Martha. Shelley had trouble focusing at the office the following day. Then finally the manuscript arrived in the mail. She found it buried in the tray reserved for new submissions. She quickly pulled it out and shut herself in her office. Her mind was now reactivated, her mental faculties running once more on all cylinders. She badly wanted to text Martha to tell her she had the manuscript and explain what she was planning to do, but she refrained. That might leave a trace, she thought. No sense in taking any foolish risks. She knew that if she managed to pull off this coup and convince her employer to publish the manuscript, and the book really did become an international bestseller, it would come under such intense scrutiny and attract busybodies of all types and no slip-up, no matter how small would escape them. Her and Martha's personal lives would be under the microscope. It mattered little whether you earned millions of dollars with a book or otherwise. Something about it made people want to know your deepest, darkest secrets. And that was not Shelley's cup of tea. The postmark on the envelope meant she didn't have a choice. Everything had to be measured with extreme precision, like on a musical score, reading time, the revisions, without forgetting, of course, the enthusiasm and joy that such a work needed to arouse. Everything needed to suggest that Shelley was just doing her job and that fate had once again smiled on her, as it had with the girl who escaped from heaven. Except that this literary hit wouldn't be simply a question of chance. Shelley was going to influence the order of things. And if things had a chance of working out according to her plans, she had to do things just as she would have with any other manuscript. She had to read it from start to finish. For two days, she gave her colleagues the impression of being focused, impassable, completely absorbed in her reading. She politely declined all sorts of distractions, even her lunch break, stoking all sorts of rumors about the nature of this mysterious manuscript. On the third day, she continued her act just a bit longer. Then, late in the morning, she got up, smoothed out her skirt, and strode down a broad hallway whose hardwood floor covered by an immense carpet muffled the sound of her determined footsteps. She came to a partly open door, out of which filtered fragments of conversation. She knocked, then, without waiting to be invited in, she marched boldly through the door and set the manuscript down before the vexed expression of Josh Marlowe, her editorial director. She had just interrupted a multi-million dollar conversation between two heavyweights of the entertainment world. Gertie Mannings, head of one of Hollywood's most powerful production companies, peered at her with an expression at once fascinated and amused. In her 30-year career, she had rarely seen such a brash entrance on the part of a common employee. Josh Marlowe's reaction was quite different. Indeed, if Shelley hadn't been a woman, and, truth be told, a quite attractive woman, so gorgeous and so sure of herself, he probably would have fired her on the spot. What the hell's gotten into you? I mean, who do you think you are? Marlowe cried, his expression contemptuous. Clearly no one's taught you any manners. With all due respect, Mr. Marlowe, after reading what I just brought you, I think you'll treat me differently next time around. The surface of the great solid oak desk was bare except for the manuscript. The atmosphere was tense, but Shelley had achieved her goal, because one thing was certain, neither of them would forget her. She feigned indignation, turned around, walked out without closing the door, and unflustered, calmly resumed her normal routine until day's end. Then another day went by, and another, until the week was over. She spent the weekend wondering whether she had overplayed her hand. 
What an idiot, she repeated to herself incessantly. Torn between the doubt of losing everything and the hope of seeing her plans come to fruition, she stayed in watching sitcoms on TV. Monday morning she looked awful, her eyes red with fatigue, which her colleagues didn't fail to notice. Only on Tuesday did things fall into place. The editorial director's secretary, a tall brunette with green eyes, came by and told her she was expected in Josh Marlowe's office without a moment's delay. Shelley rose to her feet and strode briskly toward the large door at the end of the hallway. Inside, she was nervous, almost to the point of fainting. Yet, a peculiar strength allowed her to dominate her emotions and not be bullied too much by all these gnawing fears that had plagued her mind since their last meeting. With a big smile on his face, Josh Marlowe came around his desk to greet her. He was a tall, large man, almost too large for a man his age. His weak chin and the little bit of hair he had left gave his chubby face the appearance of a light bulb. Where did this come from? asked Josh, coming over to shake her hand. Shelley was uncomfortable. His question was ambiguous, and his inquisitive look revealed an intelligent mind in that disproportionately large body. Had he found her out? He circled like a bird of prey. She felt his eyes pierce right through her, attempting to probe her mind. What's your secret, Shelley? Tell me. What's your trick? What do you mean? Shelley ventured. First Gina Warren's The Girl Who Escaped from Heaven, now Martha Daniels Searching for the Lost Ark. I'm not a fool. You're either incredibly lucky, and in this case, chance is most definitely on your side, or there's something you're not telling me. Shelley took a deep breath, looked deep into the eyes of her editorial director, who was suddenly quite intrigued, and said with all the confidence she could muster, My trick, as you put it, Mr. Marlowe, is believing in myself and not being afraid to do my job. I'm meticulous, and I don't waste time on things that aren't worth my while. He found her brashness slightly unnerving, but Josh liked that. Yes, he liked women with strong personalities who knew how to command respect. That makes two of us, Marlowe affirmed with a little smirk. Please, sit down. They were face to face, the manuscript lying on the desk between them. It's stunning, frankly. Astounding. I'm still wrapping my head around it, Josh said placing his fleshy hand on the thick stack of paper. That's the same effect it had on me, Shelley replied, and it's why I thought it best to inform you as quickly as possible, Mr. Marlowe. You were right to, and I have to admit that luck seems to be on your side. Your little theatrical entry the other day didn't pass unobserved. Gertie Mannings was quite impressed, so much so that she asked to take the manuscript with her. She's the one who convinced me to read it myself instead of waiting to submit it to our reading committee. I must say that she didn't leave me much choice. What do you mean? That when one of the biggest names in movies shows up in my office with plans for the unpublished manuscript of an unknown author into a big-budget film, there's not much I can do but accept her offer. When she heard this, Shelley was so beside herself with joy that she wanted to leap out of her chair and scream in happiness. Somehow she restrained herself and allowed her interlocutor to finish. My sincerest congratulations, Shelley. You've hit it big twice over. If it all goes well, the film will come out just after the book's publication. In the meantime, contact this mysterious Martha Daniels right away, all right? Marlowe said, handing her the manuscript. Yes, Mr. Marlowe. I'll see to it immediately. And again, Shelley, great work. You've certainly got a nose for this job. Keep it up. You're on the right track. When Shelley left Josh Marlowe's office, she was overflowing with impatience and excitement. Yet Marlowe's last words had stung. What's more, they had opened her eyes. You're on the right track. Martha had been absolutely right. Shelley realized that no matter how hard she worked for this publishing company, to them, she was nobody, just a tiny cog in a huge machine entirely interchangeable. When she returned to her tiny office, whose windows faced out onto a busy hallway, she visibly consulted the manuscript's first flyleaf and dialed Martha Daniels' phone number. Getting the answering machine, she left a message. Hello, Miss Daniels. This is Shelley Stewart from Sutton and Black Publishing. I'm pleased to inform you that your manuscript, Searching for the Lost Ark, has really caught our attention, and that we would be thrilled to meet with you and talk more about it. Given the urgency of this matter, we ask you to please contact us as soon as possible. And let me close, Miss Daniels, by wishing you a very nice day. She hung up, looked up Martha's email address on the same flyleaf, and sent her an email of the same nature as her voicemail. Every detail was important. She had to do everything perfectly, every step of the way, if she wanted it to work out. And a written trace was always the best proof that protocols had been respected to the letter. She waited, 
20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. The thought of being shut up between those walls and going about her work as usual for even just a minute longer was enough to drive her crazy. Why didn't Martha answer? She was on the verge of a nervous breakdown when Martha, in person, accompanied by the editorial director's secretary, walked past her office window without giving her the time of day. Was this all part of the plan? Did Martha have to ignore her to this extent? Didn't she deserve a little gesture of recognition at least? A testament of gratitude? A wink? A hint of a smile? A discreet wave? Shelley could find no answers to these questions and wondered whether she was growing paranoid. She certainly had been on edge lately. All this pressure had left her nerves frayed. The evening of the following day, Martha finally called. They agreed to meet at the yacht in Marina del Rey. As she waited for her on the boat preparing little smoked salmon canopies, Shelley couldn't help but thinking that Martha Daniels had already hurt her a lot. But when Martha arrived, elegantly dressed with a big white hat, her lively stride, eyes sparkling with joy and carrying a bottle of champagne, Shelley's negative feelings toward her vanished in a hurry. You were brilliant, Martha exclaimed in a burst of euphoria, embracing her briefly as she climbed aboard. It was nothing. It was my pleasure. Shelley heard herself reply, her enthusiasm returning. Next time, if there is a next time, I'll try not to be so brusque on my way in. I know it must not have been easy for you, but you understand, right? I had to play my part. Of course. Don't worry about it. I understood perfectly. My God, Shelley, I don't know how you did it, but I couldn't have planned this better. Thanks to you, I've won on all counts. Not only will my book be published around the world, they're even making it into a movie. Can you believe it? Shelley took the blow without flinching. She'd said, my book, not their book. Martha had heard her yet again. Was she doing it on purpose? Or was it just her euphoria that was making her neglect such an important detail? Because without Shelley, this book wouldn't exist. At least not in its current version the one that had blown the decision-makers away, those people with the power to bring it out of the shadow and into the light. Shelley nodded her assent. Is something wrong? said Martha, feigning surprise. No, I'm just a bit tired. All this tension has really drained me, replied Shelley, trying to keep her tone neutral. But Martha was too clever not to notice what was irking her friend. She placed a kind hand on Shelley's. Now don't you worry. I won't forget about you. You'll get your share, I promise. I know you're a good person, was Shelley's vague reply. Later that evening, Martha opened the bottle of champagne. They enjoyed it thoroughly, talking about the rosy future they both had to look forward to. Martha and Shelley were over the moon, and it was only at this point that Martha asked who the yacht belonged to, as though she'd suddenly realized where she was. Just being on board this magnificent ship, in fact, was an extraordinary experience in its own right. Shelley snorted with laughter then told her the whole story about her mother's torrid romance with the rich Texan industrialist Clyde Miller, the man who had given her this magnificent boat. Her mother had never managed to part with it. There were too many good memories associated with it, even if remembering them caused her pain. Shelley was clearly quite proud that her mother kept it, and she offered to give Martha a tour. When she caught a glimpse of the bar, Martha asked Shelley's permission to open a bottle of Bordeaux, which allowed her to continue playing sommelier a while longer. So you really know how to handle this boat? asked Martha, her amazement suffused with admiration. Like I told you, Clyde taught me everything. Could you take us for a spin offshore? I'd love to see you in action. Sure, come back whenever you like. I'd be happy to show you the marvels of navigation. But why not put this beautiful machine to work right now and go on a night tour on the open ocean? Look, there's a full moon. Wouldn't it be magnificent? Martha asked innocently. Shelley gave her a bewildered look. She wasn't delighted at the idea, but her tickled ego and the amount of alcohol she'd consumed pushed her to consent. Okay, let's go, she cried. It'll be an unforgettable experience. You can be sure about that. I don't doubt it for a second, replied Martha. You're amazing. Shelley started up the vessel and the powerful engines roared to life. As the port faded into the distance, Martha gestured toward the horizon and the waves shimmering in the moonlight a glass of wine in her hand. I hope you won't be sick, Shelley said with concern. No, not to worry. I don't get seasick on boats like this. This reply both irritated and intrigued Shelley. The thought that Martha had already sailed on a boat like hers aroused a sense of confusion in her. Yet again, Martha was pulling the rug out from under her, throwing her mind into turmoil, and an alarm bell went off inside her head. But Shelley, undoubtedly due to the effect of the alcohol, decided to ignore it. When the lights of the coast had almost disappeared, Shelley cut the engines. All was silent on the moonlit ocean.
except for the waves slapping against the keel. With Shelley's approval, Martha opened a third bottle of red wine, a Chateau Margot, 2012. It was one of the few bottles Shelley's mother really cared about. It was a reminder of a perfect bliss with Clyde, even if its date was far too recent to belong to those bygone days. I'm afraid we're going to be bored, said Martha, serving the wine. You're right, and soon we're going to be rich. At the back of the boat was a small pontoon providing access to the water. Martha got almost entirely undressed. Don't be an idiot. The water must be freezing cold, Shelley said. Come on, are you scared? Martha teased, getting the bottle of wine and her glass down near the pontoon. Caving to her friend's insistence, Shelley, too, stripped down to her underwear and jumped into the water. The frigid water provided a rude awakening to their numb limbs and muddled minds. Shelley was far drunker than Martha, yet she was realizing something strange and deeply unsettling. After they had splashed around for a few moments, Shelley noticed that it wasn't the ship's menacing black keel or a fear of the ocean depth that terrorized her. No, it was Martha's face. A face swollen with hatred, her eyes smoldered. Shelley finally saw that all her sensations of foreboding about this woman had been with good reason. Martha dragged herself out of the water and up onto the pontoon, then whipped around and hit Shelley square in the face with a bottle of Chateau Margot 2012. With a superhuman effort, face bloodied, eyes wide with horror, Shelley hung on to the edge of the boat with all her strength. But Martha wasn't finished. She hit her again, harder this time. The bottle shattered against Shelley's temple, causing her to lose consciousness. Her hands slipped off the pontoon, pulling her body into the cold, dark waters of the ocean. Martha set about cleaning up, eliminating the evidence and erasing any trace of her presence on board. When she was satisfied that everything was in order, she lowered the lifeboat into the water, turned on the engine, and maneuvered it full throttle toward the shore. Martha Daniels Three months later, Martha Daniels was living the fairy tale of which she had always dreamed. She now resided on a huge property on the heights of Bel Air, in the company of her editor, Josh Marlowe, and could truly say that she was living life to the fullest. But a phone call put an end to all that. It wasn't from the police department's homicide office, as she might have expected, but rather from Debbie Archer, her lawyer. Miss Daniels? Martha Daniels? Yes. And this is? It's Debbie Archer, your lawyer. Oh, hello, Debbie. It's been a while. To what do I owe the pleasure of your call? Might I have a little bit of your time, Miss Daniels? What is this about? Do Randolph or the Perkins clan want to extort money from me now that they know I'm rich? Martha's tone was haughty and scornful. No, don't worry, Miss Daniels. My call has nothing to do with the Perkinses. It's about your collaborator, Shelley Stewart. Martha nearly fainted at the mention of this name, as though a great glacial emptiness had suddenly flooded into her veins. Miss Daniels, are you there? Yes, I'm here, she mumbled, gradually regaining control of herself. I wanted to inform you that this morning I received a call from Shelley Stewart. What did she want? said Martha, horrified. I'm sure you can imagine, Miss Daniels. She wanted her share for having worked as your literary consultant. She wants her $1.15 million from the advance and half of all the royalties and the rest of it, film and foreign rights. But you don't have to worry, of course, because you didn't publish the book in your name, but under the pseudonym of Julia Wolfe. And as you had me specify in the contract, if your book wasn't published under the name of Martha Daniels, the contract would be invalidated and she wouldn't be paid. You're full of surprises, Miss Daniels, and you clearly thought of everything. So rest easy. She can't touch you. Goodbye. Martha hung up, gripped by panic. She rushed outside to the garage, jumped in her sports car, and sped toward the coast. She needed to be sure. As she drove, she wondered whether it was possible that Debbie was trying to blackmail her and steal her money. No, that didn't make sense. She had never asked for anything extra for her services, nor had her call seemed remotely intimidating. Her lawyer was merely informing her of a new development. It was that simple. You're full of surprises, Miss Daniels, and you clearly thought of everything. So rest easy. She can't touch you. Her lawyer's final words were echoing in her mind. Martha had the distinct sensation that she was losing it. She arrived like a shot in Marina del Rey and found a place to park. She walked briskly through the port before coming to a brusque stop, petrified with horror. The yacht was there, moored right in front of her. 
Even if she hadn't spent much time worrying about it, what with the dizzying rhythm of her new celebrity lifestyle, Martha had suspected that someone would find the boat and alert the Coast Guard, and that an investigation would be opened. But even so, who could have put the boat back in its place? As she mulled it over, one answer came naturally to mind. Her mother. Yes, as owner of the boat, only Shelley's mother would have the power to bring the yacht back to its place. Only she would have cared about it enough. Martha unlocked her phone and did a quick search on the internet, finding what she was looking for. Then she pushed her line of reasoning further, reaching for the terrible conclusion that the woman who'd called her lawyer was none other than Jennifer Davis, Shelley's mother. She looked at the photo on her phone one last time. It belonged to Jennifer Davis. She got back in the car and tried to put this episode behind her, returning to her new life in Bel Air Heights. On the way, however, she stopped off at a small gun shop and purchased a large caliber revolver. If Miss Davis were unlucky enough to decide to pay her a visit, she would be ready to greet her. Yes, if this woman so much as stepped foot on her beautiful property, Martha wouldn't hesitate to put a bullet in her head. Because if Shelley had told her mother about their plan to write a bestseller, this one bullet would eliminate one of the last pieces of the puzzle linking Martha to Shelley Stewart's murder. She would plead legitimate defense and quickly be acquitted, seeing as she had freed the city of a dangerous psychopath who trespassed on the properties of Bel Air's rich and famous. Nonetheless, she had to admit that she had made a big mistake that day in Debbie Archer's office. When she laid out the terms of the contract, Martha wasn't planning to kill Shelley in cold blood. But after seeing her on the yacht half-drunk, speculating about all the things the two of them were going to achieve with their talent, Martha realized that Shelley was going to be a problem. She would never accept being a mere ghostwriter. She would want her piece of the pie, maybe more. And that was unacceptable, because Martha had never intended to pay her a single, solitary cent. This was why she decided to put a clause in the contract stipulating that the book had to be published in the name of Martha Daniels. She had known from the beginning that she would never publish it under her own name, for fear of seeing Randolph Perkins suddenly reappear in her new life. Julia Wolfe seemed like the ideal solution, the perfect name to neutralize them both. But now things had taken an unexpected turn and Martha had to be ready for anything, because the future was suddenly looking quite uncertain. When she pulled up to her imposing front gate, she was reassured to see the security guard in his enclosure. Good evening, Miss Daniels. Is everything all right? asked the man in charge of surveillance, sensing her preoccupation. Martha gave him a big smile. Yes, Norbert, everything's fine, thank you. Have a good night, ma'am. The gate opened and Martha accelerated up the driveway that snaked through the large front garden surrounding her beautiful home. She parked her car and noticed that the spot beside it was empty. The Ferrari wasn't there. Suddenly she remembered that Josh had told her he wouldn't be home tonight. He was attending a publisher's conference in Newport Beach. She headed toward the front entrance quickly climbed the stairs, and before closing the door behind her, cast a glance over her shoulder. Tonight, the big garden scared her. She double-locked the bathroom door and turned on the shower, unwinding for a few minutes under the warm water. When she got out, her mind was clearer, her body relaxed. She threw on a silk aquamarine pajama and went downstairs to prepare dinner. The kitchen was spacious, with state-of-the-art accessories on a large marble countertop in the center of the room beautifully illuminated by the drop ceiling's lights. The day had been exhausting. A glass of wine would do her good. She wondered if Josh had brought a bottle up from the cellar. She looked in the refrigerator door. That was where he normally kept them. This time, however, she was out of luck. She had no choice but to go down and look for one. The cellar's architecture had been carefully designed, and when she neared the entryway, the lights came on automatically, revealing an incredible variety of bottles that seemed to be sleeping, lying on their side. She grabbed a bottle without too much thought, a Pomerol 2009, and didn't linger. It was getting late, and as she began her third glass, lounging on her couch, she noticed the bottle sitting above the fireplace. When she came closer, a chill ran down her spine. Her fingers grabbed the neck and turned it like a screwdriver, and the bottle pivoted in place, revealing the label in its entirety. Martha stepped back. Her glass slipped from her hand, shattering on the floor. Chateau Margot, 2012. The name paralyzed her. She was unable to look away, yet she only wanted to do one thing, get as far away from here as possible, and quickly. She lunged toward the couch, grabbed the loaded revolver she'd hidden in the drawer of the end table, removed the safety, stood up and pointed it in front of her, all her senses on maximum alert. Jennifer, I know you're there, so stop playing your little games with me right now. Miss Davis, I didn't kill your daughter. Do you hear me? It was an accident. You have to believe me. 
she said imploringly toward the emptiness, her panicky eyes flitting in every direction, like hunted prey awaiting its predator. Martha hurriedly made her way to the entryway electrical panel and stealthily pressed a red button. Ten minutes later, she wondered why the security guard still hadn't shown up. Where the hell was he? She tried calling the police, but unfortunately the phone battery was dead. After all the time spent on Jennifer Davis's Facebook page, she'd forgotten to recharge it. There was a large mirror in the entrance hall. Passing in front of it, Martha saw her own face twisted with fear, and just a few steps behind, the smiling face of Shelley, disfigured by terrible scars. Gun in hand, Martha spun around, but she wasn't fast enough to get a shot off. A man came up from behind her and hit the base of her skull with a blunt object, knocking her out. She crumpled to the floor. Detective Karen Katz A month and a half later, in North Hollywood, the office of private detective Karen Katz. Her red hair, styled in a bob, blue eyes, around 40, Karen Katz looked out the window toward the sidewalk a few floors below. All sorts of people were walking by, attending to their business, each of their lives taking them in a different direction. Given her line of work, Detective Katz knew that some of them concealed terrible secrets, and all of them were potential clients. But Karen only took cases she judged to be of great interest, those that were important to her. It was a luxury she could afford. She had made quite a reputation in the field. Her powerful intuition and stunning deductive abilities had solved numerous mysterious disappearances. Yet even she had to admit that she'd been going through a rough patch recently. How long had it been since a worthwhile case came around? She was lost in such thoughts of this sort when there was a sudden knock at the door. Come in. The door opened and an elegantly dressed woman in a turquoise green outfit appeared. As she rose to greet her, Karen quickly studied her physiognomy. She seemed agitated, and there was a vacant look on her face. Sit down, please, Karen said, gesturing politely toward a chair. The mysterious woman sat down, and Karen returned to her large leather armchair on the other side of the desk. There was a brief silence in which they simply looked at one another, sizing each other up. Then the female detective broke the ice. What can I do for you, miss? The reason I've come isn't something I can explain in a few words, so I hope you have enough time to hear the whole story. If not, there's no point in my staying, and I'll be forced to forego your services. The woman's frankness was disarming, bordering on insulting, yet her words had aroused Detective Katz's curiosity. Not to worry. I have the whole day ahead of me, taking out a cheap ballpoint pen and used notepad out of a desk drawer. The woman didn't fail to notice these details and said so. I was led to believe you had no shortage of clients and were hard to get a hold of. I do hope your investigative skills are still on par with your reputation, because I get the distinct impression, Karen, that things aren't going too well for you at the moment. Detective Katz didn't appreciate this woman being so familiar with her, but she decided to ignore this detail. You are correct. The streets aren't exactly teeming with cases worthy of my time. The fact is, I'm very demanding in my choice of clientele. I know. I made inquiries about you. And that is precisely why I came. Because you are the right person for me, Karen. The only one who can understand. The price will be right. For me, money isn't an issue. A fact she emphasized by taking a checkbook out of her purse. We'll get to that later. First, I need to evaluate your case. Karen flipped open her notepad. May I have your name, miss? My name is Martha Daniels. Writing has always been my passion. Two years ago, I was just coming off of a stormy affair with a married man named Randolph Perkins. To put this painful breakup behind me, I poured myself into writing a novel. In the book world, finding a serious company to publish your work isn't easy. So when Chance placed Shelley Stewart on my path, I knew I had to seize my opportunity. We had gone to the same school as teenagers and were well acquainted. And then one day, out of the blue, she reappeared. She was temping as a reader at Sutton and Black Publishing. And I, well, I had a manuscript. The opportunity was too good to pass up. We made a pact. If she was able to convince her employer to publish my manuscript, I would give her half of my earnings. She would be my Trojan horse. But what I hadn't anticipated was that she was very gifted in the writing domain, particularly when it came to textural revision. I found out when she gave me her revised version of my manuscript. Her work had been anything but superficial, and I admit I felt almost a hatred toward her for it. She had told me that she would tweak it a bit to make it more appetizing for her editors. So how dare she make such drastic changes, even without consulting me first? But when I finished reading it, I had to admit that her work was exceptional. Inside, I already suspected that I was the rough diamond. 
and she was the artisan jeweler who would soon present the world with a priceless literary jewel. Caught off guard by what she'd heard, Detective Karen Katz interrupted her. You'll say in this book has already come out? That it's a bestseller? I must certainly have heard of it then. Undoubtedly, our masterpiece is even going to be made into a movie. Julia Wolfe's Searching for the Lost Ark. Detective Katz stopped writing, her pen in midair, then leaned slightly forward and blinked. Julia Wolfe, she said, unable to suppress a laugh. As in the famous novelist? Yes, her future client replied gravely. Tell me, Miss Daniels, in your view, who is Julia Wolf? I am Julia Wolf. Julia Wolf is my pseudonym, the woman replied threateningly. Please continue, Miss Daniels, said the detective, as she took notes, a bemused look on her face. You're saying that you are Julia Wolf? Yes, she sighed. The famous, wildly successful novelist the whole world is talking about? Yes, exactly. Then how do you explain the fact that you don't look like her? The detective took out her phone and did a quick search, her index finger dancing around the screen. When she finished, she got up and walked around to the other side of the desk. In a calm voice, she said, Stand up for me, please, Miss Daniels. The mysterious woman obeyed. Let's walk over in front of this mirror, shall we? said the detective, pointing to the large piece of glass near the door. Look at yourself. Good. Now look at this image of Julia Wolf on my phone. What do you see, Miss Daniels? The woman suddenly burst into tears, let out a blood-curdling shriek, and stepped closer to the mirror. They stole my body, my face, my life, everything I had, she said coldly to her reflection, digging her sharp nails into her cheeks. Seeing her face bleeding, Detective Katz intervened and stopped her before she disfigured herself entirely. Get a hold of yourself, Miss Daniels. Don't be a fool. Calm yourself and sit back down. Karen played nurse, treating her scratches with a cotton ball dipped in antiseptic she found in the first aid kit that all good detectives keep on hand. Then she sat back down in her chair. She opened her notepad and began methodically rereading her notes under her would-be client's attentive stare, trying to bring all the details, even the most seemingly insignificant ones, into focus. Details like the name of the prestigious bank on her checkbook, or the six-figure amount on the tab of the previous check she'd quite conspicuously displayed suggested she must be very wealthy indeed. Yet, though her outfit was prohibitively expensive, the neck and sleeves looked worn, like they were all she had, and lacked the means to buy more like them. Her over-the-top remarks and irrational behavior left no doubt as to the fragility of her mental state. An ordinary detective would have taken her for a basket case ripe for the asylum, but Karen Katz was no ordinary detective. Karen's sixth sense told her there may have been some truth to all of this, so she invited her client to continue her incredible tale. I should be spending the rest of my days in prison for murder, the enigmatic woman confessed. She then told the entire story, first revealing how she arranged the contract with Debbie Archer, the attorney who had defended her against the Perkins clan, so that Shelley wouldn't receive any of what Martha had promised her. Then she unveiled everything that took place on the yacht that fateful night, when she gave free rein to all the brutality she was capable of battering Shelley to death and abandoning her body in the blackness of the ocean. And you know what? She remarked impassively. I've never felt the least bit of remorse. Shelley Stewart was dead, and Julia Wolfe was making her grand entrance into the entertainment world. I finally experienced this wonderful life full of lovely surprises that I desired so much. Money was pouring in, and all was beauty and refinement, until the day that everything came crashing down. Here, this letter explains it all and she handed the detective an envelope. Karen Katz took it, unfolded the sheet of paper contained within, and began reading aloud. The bottle didn't kill me, Martha. I made you think that you dealt me the fatal blow. My survival instinct could sense that you would have no mercy. Alone in the cold water, I watched you take off in the life raft. I swam with all my strength toward the yacht. Once aboard, very much alive, I saw how you'd ravaged my beautiful face. My violent desire for vengeance gave me the strength to resist the pain of the needle I used to try to stitch myself back together. Do you believe in providence, Martha? In divine justice? Well, you might after what I'm about to tell you. I was like a wounded animal. People looked away when I walked by. Children made fun of me, and I lost my job because I didn't dare show up anymore. Several weeks went by before I made up my mind to find a good plastic surgeon. After searching far and wide, I finally found him. The reviews were unanimous. He was the best in the business. I made an appointment and paid a visit to his clinic. He agreed to see me in his office, and while he was examining me, without thinking, I looked at the photos that hung like trophies on his wall, and one of them was you, Martha. 
That was when I told him everything, that you were the cause of my misfortune, the one who disfigured me. Each detail I gave him reinforced the belief he placed in my words. And when I told him about your lawyer, Debbie Archer, he knew it was all true. He confessed that he thought you were incredibly attractive, that you represented an ideal of beauty few could rival. Your portrait was in the center of all the others precisely because he hadn't needed to operate on you. But your hateful personality had pushed him away from you. That was why he ended up hating you, Martha. It was only your body that obsessed him. And upon examining me more attentively, he quickly noticed similarities between you and me. So I made a pact with Randolph Perkins. I agreed to become you, because only he had the power to repair the injustices I'd suffered. So long, Shelley Stewart. Detective Katz set the letter down on the desk and her mind kicked into gear. The letter was no proof. It wasn't even written in the author's hand, but typed. Everything was perfectly orchestrated. Had the mysterious woman sitting in front of her made it all up? She did say she was a novelist, didn't she? If this was the case, Detective Katz was dealing with a truly cunning woman. Debbie Archer was clearly the key to the story's credibility. Indeed, the mention of her name had tipped the balance and convinced Randolph Perkins of the veracity of his new patient's words. Having faced the attorney before, he knew what Debbie Archer was capable of. A woman for whom the law was everything, even, it seemed, to the detriment of justice. She wouldn't have hesitated to defend the worst criminal to the best of her abilities. But he also knew that she had integrity and wasn't going to risk her job revealing the business she had handled for Martha, and certainly not the matters concerning Randolph Perkins, who, according to what the Internet reported vis-à-vis -vis his personal fortune, was one of the most powerful men in Los Angeles. Providence? Divine justice? Thought Detective Katz. What if everything in that letter was actually true? What was it they said about truth being stranger than fiction? The detective searched on her phone for Shelley Stewart. Several photos appeared, but none matched. She continued scrolling with her thumb, however, and suddenly, a now familiar face appeared. It was her client's. Yes, her client. The woman's story intrigued her, and Detective Katz's deductive instinct strongly suspected that this story hid something even darker. Karen Katz was ready to dive in, to get to the bottom of the mystery. As a last scruple, she typed in, Martha Daniels. Looking back at her from the screen was the radiant smile of Julia Wolfe. So Martha Daniels and Julie Wolfe really were one and the same, as this mysterious woman claimed. But if this were so, why did she have Martha Daniels' checkbook? Because that was the name Detective Katz had read on it at the start of this disconcerting interview. I never thought she'd manage to swim back to the boat. She seemed far too drunk, said the woman, breaking the silence and cutting short the detective's musings. You seem quite the gifted navigator yourself, Miss Daniels. Making it all the way to the shore in a life raft at night? It's no easy achievement. Why didn't you take the yacht? That would have facilitated your task and avoided a whole lot of trouble. The detective was trying to put herself in the place of the other woman whose ruthlessness seemed to know no bounds. Yes, and it's a choice I regret. If I'd taken the yacht, Shelley Stewart would never have made it back alive. But I wanted people to think it had been an accident. Tell me what happened to you, Miss Daniels. As I said, one of my assailants knocked me out. I'm nearly certain it was Randolph in person. Who else could it have been? Shelley and he kidnapped me right under the security guard's nose. They'd planned everything. Josh Marlowe, my companion, wasn't there that night. He was at a conference in Newport Beach. The guard's alarm had been disactivated, and as Shelley so eloquently put it in her letter, perhaps Divine Justice had it in for me, because my phone battery was dead, preventing me from calling the police. After that, I don't remember things too clearly. My memories are hazy. I can make out the operating table, the operating theater, Shelley's naked body lying near me, and all this light inundating my eyes, even after closing them to avoid being blinded. I remember that it wasn't human hands that were touching me. No, these were awful, jointed steel arms, no doubt controlled by some form of artificial intelligence. They worked quickly, far too quickly on my face, hips, belly, hands, legs, and all the rest of my body, Miss Daniels cried out in horror. How had Shelley been willing to accept this bloody massacre offering me her whole body? That's right, Karen. All the flesh in front of you belongs to Shelley Stewart. Those machines grafted onto me everything that was hers, onto her all that was mine. As you can see, Randolph Perkins, this abominable monster, stole from me more than just my beauty. By engaging in this unspeakable procedure, he turned Shelley and me into his guinea pigs. To him were nothing but lab rats. I would have much preferred those machines kill me than have to go on living this nightmare. 
by reconstructing Shelley's disfigured face on me, Randolph thinks he's been generous. He's sorely mistaken. If he hadn't, at least when I looked in the mirror, I would have had that satisfaction, enjoyed seeing her in that state. Anyhow, you'll excuse me, Karen, if I no longer know exactly who I am. Very well, Miss Daniels. How may I be of service to you? So you accept the case, said the woman, a glimmer of hope in her suffering, hate-filled eyes. Yes, I'd very much like to bring the whole truth behind your story to light, because what you've told me so far is merely scratching the surface. With my investigative prowess, we'll see how your account measures up to reality. One moment, said the woman, placing her checkbook on the desk. With a pretty fountain pen, she wrote an amount on one of the checks, detached it, and slid it toward Detective Katz. Karen looked at the piece of paper, vaguely uneasy. This is a lot of money. I fear that you'll need to obtain a preliminary authorization. It's my money, and I have absolute confidence in my bank. Karen took the check, looked at it, and frowned. Except that you aren't Martha Daniels. In fact, I'd like to know how you came into possession of this checkbook. Because according to what you've told me, she said, consulting her notepad, you were in your pajamas when your assailants kidnapped you. I should tell you that it was only after the post-surgery pain treatment ended that I regained full possession of my mental faculties. It was like I was emerging from a coma, and my awakening was as brutal as it was incomprehensible. I was in a large bed, alone, with an unobstructed view of the sea. I went to the bathroom, and I admit that the shock I received from seeing myself in the mirror almost killed me instantaneously. Randolph Perkins had turned me into his marionette, and somehow, while I was unconscious, sent me to the other side of the world, to Fiji. I later realized he had sent me down there to stall for time and organize his living arrangements with his new flesh doll, Shelley Stewart. They had given me her passport and all her documents, as well as her credit card with its PIN and her bank account number and its internet access code. Since my appearance now corresponded with the name and photos of all her official documents, I was obliged to accept them. There wasn't much in Shelley's account, just $5,000, barely enough to pay for a one-way trip to Los Angeles and a few nights in a hotel. But I had another card to play. Randolph had definitely not thought of everything. Upon arriving at LAX, I jumped in a taxi and headed for Wilshire Boulevard, where I still had my apartment, the one I'd kept from my previous life. The building's access code hadn't changed, luckily for me. I've always had the terrible habit of simply slamming the door shut when I leave home without locking it. One day I locked myself out and found myself out on the landing in my slippers. A neighbor saw me, and when I explained my predicament, he laughed and took out a plastic card and swiped it rapidly along the door opening, near the bolt of the lock, and as if by magic the door opened. Needless to say, that evening I had no problem getting back into my house. But I wasn't there because I longed to sleep somewhere familiar. No. I'd come looking for something. Martha Daniels' checkbook. I wrote myself a check for $200,000 and deposited it the next day in Shelley Stewart's account. When the funds came through, I transferred them to another account I'd just opened, in case my handlers decided to try to make off with them. I knew, in fact, that they too had the codes for Shelley's account. I began spending the money, buying a few luxury items on Rodeo Drive, and then I splurged on this magnificent $7,000 outfit I'm wearing today. The money seemed to fly out of my hands, and I soon had to rein in my enthusiasm. So yes, you're certainly right. The false Martha may have realized that a little money is missing from her huge piggy bank, but then again she may not have. While I wait, I'm keeping this checkbook, and if by any chance the check for $10,000 I've just written you bounces, let me know, and I'll take them from the $170,000 I still have. What you have told me is truly astonishing, Miss Daniels. You really do have an answer for everything. I'm quite tempted to believe you. Nevertheless, there's one question that bothers me. How is it that in just one month, after such an invasive operation, you don't display any after-effects, not the smallest bruise, no visible scars? I would have to think that after such a complex operation, the body would require long months of immobility to fully recover. Among my few hazy memories of the operation, I sometimes see myself completely bathed in translucent liquid, a prisoner inside a hermetic container, breathing only thanks to a tube jammed deep in my throat. It may have been some sort of cellular regeneration accelerator. If what you say is true, the plastic surgery field science seems to have progressed by leaps and bounds and now be capable of performing genuine miracles. Absolutely fascinating. However, I'm sorry to have to disappoint you, Miss Daniels, said Detective Katz, pushing away the check, but I only accept cash. 
This allows me to ensure my client's total discretion. No one must be able to retrace their identity. I work incognito, a creature of the shadows. As you can surely understand in this sort of business, I'm committed to the safety of my clients, but also to my own. And $5,000 will suffice. Yes, give me $5,000 cash, and I'll try to unmask the true guilty parties concealed behind this whole terrible plot. I'll go for the money immediately, said the woman, rising to her feet. I'll be back within an hour if that works for you. Like I said, I don't have anything on my plate today. Not to worry. I'll be here. The mysterious woman left the office, and Karen Katz took advantage to stretch her limbs and relax for a bit. This crazy story would undoubtedly be full of surprises, given how difficult it was to imagine that the woman who just walked out the door was occupying someone else's body. The mere mention of it was disturbing almost blasphemous, or an appalling act performed by creatures with terribly disturbed minds, the blackness of whose soul was nearly unfathomable. But there was no fooling Detective Katz. She wasn't taken in. She'd seen through this horrible game of terror. Shelley was the first victim. Her greed had made her naive and an ideal prey for the countless swindlers who run rampant throughout the world. And that was when Martha Daniels appeared to illuminate her monotonous life except that from then on, their destinies would be forever joined and their lives would take a dangerous turn. Neither woman was better than the other. Martha was a formidable con artist, as well as a murderer. And influenced by Martha and out of necessity, Shelley had turned into a dangerous psychopath who was still at large. As for Dr. Randolph Perkins, she still wasn't sure exactly how to describe him. Such was the detective's alarming assessment of the situation when the woman stepped back into her office. Here are your $5,000, Karen. Use them well, she said jubilantly. Detective Katz decided to let this last phrase go uncommented. She took a sort of walkie-talkie out of her desk drawer and slid it toward the woman. I'll keep you informed of the investigation's progress on this secure line, said Katz, nodding at the device. Do not try to contact me. From now on, I'll get in touch with you. Make sure it's always on and always within reach. The woman attempted a nervous smile, grabbed the walkie-talkie, and said in a strangely gentle voice, Thank you. Detective Katz smiled back. She refrained from saying that she didn't like her one bit, and that from the moment she'd walked through her office door, the woman's aura had rubbed her the wrong way, and that if she accepted the case, it wasn't to aid a murderer of the worst sort, but rather to bring to light the full cruelty of her intentions. Karen walked her to the door. You'll be hearing from me soon. Goodbye, Miss Daniels. Talk to you soon, Karen, the woman murmured coldly. She delicately placed her hand on the back of Detective Katz's, then walked out. The following day, Karen Katz left her office, put Hollywood in the rearview mirror, and headed for Bel Air to do some quick recon on the area surrounding Julia Wolfe's residence. When she located it, she parked a short distance away and got out of the car, a large camera concealed in the pocket of her long overcoat. The neighborhood was calm and peaceful, as though time had stopped on this beautiful sunny afternoon. She walked along nonchalantly outside the mansion's imposing metal gate, uncovering her powerful lens at hip height and shooting everything within range. She returned to her car and studied the array of photos on the device's screen. Unbelievable, she exclaimed. At the end of a long driveway winding through a magnificent garden was a woman, standing on the front steps. It was Julia Wolfe, without a doubt, and she looked worried. Karen Katz was lost in thought when a metallic gray convertible raced out through the open gate. She lowered her head as it passed, then decided to tail it. The Ferrari came to a stop at a renowned Beverly Hills hotel, and Karen Katz parked a good distance away so she could observe the hot rod's mysterious driver through her powerful lens. The man was sizable, his clothing sufficiently loose to hide his portly physique. Karen opened the trunk of her car and took a sound amplifier disguised as a bouquet of roses. Then she slipped an audio receiver into her ear and hid it from view with a magnificent beige hat. The man was seated out on the patio in the company of an older woman. Karen walked past without their noticing and sat down a short distance away. She set her bouquet of roses on the table and casually, without really looking at them, listened in on their conversation. What's going on, Josh? I need answers. Understand? I know, Gertie, but for Christ's sake, I don't know what's gotten into her. Ever since she went off on that trip to I don't know where, I get the impression she's no longer the same woman. I thought she said she'd spent a few weeks in Hawaii. That's what she claims. But when I checked, her name doesn't appear anywhere. Not on any flights. Not in any hotel registry. I'm sure that she never set foot there. You think she lied to you? But why? I don't have a clue. 
Could she be seeing someone? Have you asked yourself that? She's extremely attractive, I admit, but something is upsetting her, and it seems far darker and more mysterious than an ordinary romantic fling. Sometimes I wonder if she really wrote Searching for the Lost Ark. What do you mean? The other day she scribbled a few pages and I happened to get a look at them. They were well written, but there is nothing there. Nothing capable of satisfying the ravenous appetites of an audience starred for something new. It was flat, insipid, totally mundane. Listen closely to what I'm about to say, because I'm not going to say it again. In light of the extraordinary success this first book promises, I committed to making a sequel. But this isn't small fry here. We're not talking about a budget of a few hundred thousand dollars. We are talking about several hundred million dollars. So sort things out however you like. But get her back on track ASAP, because if you don't, I will drop you, Josh, and you won't get a penny more from the film's revenues. I hope I've been clear. Josh Marlowe sighed and lowered his head, and Gertie left. Back in her office, Detective Katz thought back over the day's events. Looking at the photo of Julia Wolfe she'd taken with her lens's powerful zoom that afternoon, she studied the woman's facial features. Despite the splendor of her abode, Julia Wolfe seemed lost, and her disoriented look was that of a woman backed into a corner. Karen had just begun to scratch the surface of her client's frightening story, and troubling evidence was already appearing, as if to authenticate Ms. Daniel's credibility. The detective did not sleep well that night, plagued by harrowing dreams, and woke up early. She spent the early morning hours making the necessary preparations so indispensable to her work. When ten o'clock rolled around, she left home and headed for North Beverly Hills and the clinic of Dr. Randolph Perkins. She parked in the tiny lot in front of a white four-floor building, whose perfectly opaque windows offered no clue to what went on inside. Karen Katz had called to schedule a consultation the day before, and quite unusually, Dr. Perkins had been available the very next day to see her. She rang the bell, and a large glass door, undoubtedly bulletproof, opened onto a luxuriously designed hallway dominated by white marble. An unusually beautiful, tall, blonde receptionist came up to greet her. An insolently dazzling smile illuminated her pretty face with its peachy pink skin. Mrs. Katz, Karen Katz, she began, as though she already knew who she was. Karen thought how typical this was of this sort of place. They always made you feel like you were someone important, one of the chosen ones, the elite. Yes, I have an appointment with Dr. Perkins for a consultation, Karen replied politely. Certainly, Ms. Katz. This way, please, said the gorgeous receptionist, inviting her to take a seat in the spacious, minimalist waiting room. The detective flipped through a specialist magazine on plastic surgery, but it curiously said nothing about breast implants, liposuction, buttock lifts, or other similar fantasies you would expect to read about in a plastic surgery clinic. All it showed were bodies and faces, each one more perfect than the one before, pushing their beauty toward an unattainable perfection. Absorbed as she was in contemplating these images, at first she failed to notice the piercing, ice-blue gaze that was avidly studying her. She wondered how long she had been in this predator's crosshairs. Nevertheless, in a flash of lucidity, Karen Katz got up with a smile and quickly regained her composure. The seductive Dr. Randolph Perkins, in his white coat and designer suit, stood out even among all the men portrayed in the magazine she'd just been glancing at. Karen followed him docilely into his office where she was surprised not to find any white-coated personnel parading back and forth. But Dr. Perkins' first remark was even more intriguing. For what we do here, I only have a limited trust in the human species. As far as I know, Ms. Katz, no man on Earth has the power or ability to handle a scalpel with as much precision as our machines. You won't find any surgeons in my clinic, not in the usual sense of the word at least. But you'll soon become aware of the incredible achievements these machines are capable of. What you say is truly fascinating, Dr. Perkins. Your words fill me with joy, said the doctor, forgetting to smile. Sit down, please. The door closed behind them. That was when Karen recognized the photos displayed on the wall, including the one of Martha Daniels. She now realized that she was playing a very dangerous game. Pardon me, but I'm not exactly clear about the reason for your visit, said the doctor, his voice imbued with a paternal gentleness. It's just a routine examination but I wanted the opinion of a renowned expert such as yourself, Dr. Perkins. Katz amused herself by replying. I'm flattered, he said, inviting her to undress almost entirely. The doctor put on his surgeon's gloves and began evaluating certain particularly sensitive parts of her body, examining her with great care. He then shared his appraisal. 
I hope you'll allow me to speak freely. Frankness is quite important in our field. Yes, of course, Karen said innocently. You are remarkably well-preserved for your age. Time seems to have forgotten about you, which makes your body a very interesting object of study. In addition, I see that your trunk is quite strong. The tone of your legs and firmness of your glutes testify to vigorous training. What sport do you practice? None, per se. Let's just say I keep myself in shape, the detective replied evasively. I see. Fine work. Keep doing what you're doing. It certainly seems to be working. I can't help noticing, however, that despite its firmness, your chest is a little small. What would you say to a breast augmentation? For the moment, I prefer not. Well, feel free to come back and see us when you change your mind. I also noticed a few unsightly wrinkles next to your left eye. I could easily have those taken care of. No, thank you. I'm not sure I want to get rid of them for the time being, Karen replied, starting to feel a bit uncomfortable. Listen, Miss Gatz, I sense you're a bit reluctant to experience our revolutionary technology, which I assure you uses the most highly specialized operating techniques. So let me make you a proposal. No, really, don't thank me, said the doctor, utterly unconcerned with her opinion, as though he were sure she'd accept. I'm offering you a free session of our cellular regeneration treatment. Try it, and you'll come out transformed. There's nothing better for boosting muscle oxygenation and body tone, I guarantee you. You're offering me this treatment for free? Yes, and don't be embarrassed. We frequently make such offers to our future clients. Look at it as a premium exploratory pass. It gives us a chance to break the ice and build a bond of trust with our clientele. All right, then. I accept. But on one condition. You promise me there won't be any surgery. Naturally, Miss Katz. For the moment, you can get dressed and return to our waiting room. Someone will get you, said Dr. Perkins as he left the office. The attendant from before was already outside the door, and she led Karen directly into the treatment room. The environment was spacious, all in white marble with a drop ceiling providing subdued lighting and, in the center, a large, volcanic rock basin similar to a jacuzzi. The attendant gave her a towel, a bathrobe, slippers, and appropriate undergarments. Go ahead and relax in this marvelous tub. I'll be back in 30 minutes. Karen put on a bathing suit in the latest fashion and headed for the bubbling liquid. The tub wasn't deep, but was long enough to do a few strokes. Karen slowly waded into the swirl of warm water and felt a gentle euphoria wash over her. She was just beginning to genuinely enjoy it when she felt a presence behind her. She wasn't fast enough. Two powerful hands grabbed her upper arms and prevented her from escaping. She did manage to see her assailant's face, however. To her great surprise, she recognized the receptionist. Then Perkins appeared. You're powerless against her. She has hydraulic arms. They can lift a car on their own. What do you want? Karen yelled. I know who you are, Detective Karen Katz. I also know why you're here and, most important of all, who sent you. When I switched Shelley's and Martha's bodies, I injected them both with an undetectable chip that allows me to track their positions. Martha made it through all the airport security checks without detectors going off. If she had any doubt about me tracking her, I wanted her to put it out of her mind. In fact, this was one of the reasons for having her take that little trip. And it's why she didn't suspect that when she came back from her trek to Fiji, I was already following her every move on the screen of my portable tracker. I saw her return to her apartment, then come to see you. You know too much, Katz. I need you to disappear. You'll never get away with this, you degenerate psychopath. Sooner or later, someone will notice I'm gone. Once again, you are mistaken. I'm going to clone you, cats. But taking care to remove a part of your memory, the one that concerns me, to be precise, and slow down your brilliant deductive skills a little bit. But don't worry. Your body will be an impeccable resource for science. To me, you're a priceless gift. Take her to the cellular reprogramming accelerator, he said to his humanoid robot. Goodbye, cats. Not so fast, cried a voice from behind Dr. Perkins. If I were you, I'd avoid doing anything stupid. Try anything and you're as good as dead. Now be reasonable and tell your scrap heap of a doll to release my colleague. The voice belonged to a tall brunette with a top model's looks and a big revolver in each hand. Right on time, Detective Katz said calmly to her colleague and friend. The truth is often in the details, Doctor, and you have no idea what's going on here. By always trusting in your machines, you didn't seek out the cause of those unsightly wrinkles next to my left eye. If you had... You might have noticed that I have a bionic eye, which contains a hyper-powerful camera capable of capturing all spectra of light. 
My friend and colleague here, Mia, saw everything I saw, and you are currently on camera. Broadcast live on the police website. You'll screw, Dr. Perkins. Abby! Perkins yelled in the direction of the humanoid woman. Then he paused and said coldly, Crush her and deal with her friend. A loud blast made Dr. Perkins jump. The bullet passed just centimeters from Karen's head, pulverizing the robot's right eye and lodging itself in her iron brain. The humanoid released her hold. Flames devoured her beautiful blonde hair, and her synthetic flesh melted miserably off her metal face. Karen got loose, allowing Mia to fire at the other eye, after which the robot's head exploded. Mia tossed one of her revolvers to Karen, who caught it on the fly. The doctor took advantage of the chaos to make a break for it, but Karen raced after him. She lost sight of him around the corner of a long hallway, and that was when they appeared. Four scalpel-wielding surgeon robots were heading straight for her. Wearing only a bikini, she was offering truly choice flesh to these steel butchers. But Detective Katz stared them down, motionless, then took two of them out with shots to their left eyes. Mia arrived at a run and blew off the skulls of the other two, emptying her cartridge on the last one just before it could plant its scalpel in her heart. Dr. Perkins had hidden behind a lab bench, trembling like a hunted animal. Karen and Mia reloaded their revolvers and broke down the door, at which point a terrified Dr. Perkins charged at them, scalpel in hand. Karen and Mia shot him in both legs, sending him sprawling to the floor, screaming in pain. When the police arrived, the commander thanked Detectives Karen Katz and Mia Anderson, specialists in extricable situations, for helping them unmask a criminal of the worst sort, operating right in the middle of Beverly Hills. During the in-depth search of Dr. Perkins' clinic, law enforcement officials were shocked to discover the atrocities he'd perpetrated in the name of science. All these rich, disillusioned housewives who had come looking for support and dreamed of unlocking the beauty hidden within their souls. To this day, despite the huge sums of money his family has spent trying to free him, Randolph Perkins continues to serve a life sentence in the state of California. Martha Daniels, identified with the features of Shelley Stewart, is locked up in a mental hospital on account of her split personality disorder and multiple uncontrolled acts of violence against her own person. Shelley Stewart, identified with the features of Martha Daniels, has shared the same fate since her attempted suicide. And doubt still persists regarding the identity of the famous author of Searching for the Lost Ark. No one knows who Julia Wolfe truly is.